Okay, so can anybody hear me? Everybody? <laughs> okay, so good afternoon. I'm Vratislav Podzimek. I'm the member of the Anaconda installer team, and I would like to introduce you some pieces of architecture of the new Anaconda installer. So today's topic will be first the basic question, what is Anaconda? Then why we did a rewrite or why we have been doing the rewrite because it's still not finished. Then we will get to the new UI, which is something I've chosen as a code name for the new Anaconda. Then to then we will get to its architecture, data representation, and the basic GUI model, or so the text mode model. Then to threads and communication. And we will finish with the initial setup, which is the new first boot. And the add-on development. The purpose of this presentation is to deliver you a notion about how Anaconda looks like internally and if it's possible to encourage you to write add-ons, because that would be really great for us. So what is Anaconda? It is an operating system installer used by Fedora, RHEL, and the derivatives, and it's doing everything but installation, because YAM is doing the package installation, or rsync is doing the image installation in case of the live CD. From the other point of view, it's also a Python package called PyAnaconda, plus the main script, uh, some Dracut files, and unit files for systemd. The one thing I would like you to keep in mind, keep it in mind during the whole presentation is that Anaconda is supposed to support both automated and manual installation, or also any combination of these two types. It is also supposed to support graphical mode and the text mode for old sequential only terminals on old hardware but still used. And what is the trickiest part is that it's supposed to be simple and yet complex in the same time. So what, why we have been doing the rewrite? Actually, it was decided at the FATCON Tempe 2011, what was the first opportunity where the whole team meet together, without me, because I wasn't the member of the team in those days. And the main reasons for the rewrite were that Anaconda had a non-modern UI that was born more than 10 years ago with any significant change. The UI controlling logic was mixed with the installation logic in the code. So it was quite hard to add something new or even harder to modify anything. It was basically a single thread application and the GTK main loop was not run the way you know it because the code was basically stepping the GTK main loop in the callbacks, for example. So for example, if you switch to TTI2 to get to the shell while there was package installation and then you got back to the X server, you saw only a gray screen until the package was installed and the screen was redrawn. Also, another problem was that there were KS data, which is kickstart data, uh, plus the install data and the UI elements attributes and the data altogether was stored in those three places or three types of places and it was quite hard to keep them synchronized or prioritized and stuff like that. Also, it was GTK2 and PyGTK based, which are both libraries that are no longer developed. And there were some Glade files used, but also a lot of stuff was created dynamically in the code. So it was really not something you want to have in your GUI application. And last but not least, the NCURSIS-based text mode had almost 
separate code base. So this is what I call the scary anaconda. And now we get to the new UI and it's like no more scary anaconda. So the result is that the new UI anaconda is modular, it's extensible and it's multi-thread. So when some long lasting action takes place, the user can interact with the UI, it is responsive and the user can do anything what they need to do and just wait for the result to appear on the UI. As the basic model, we used the hub and spoke model. We will get to it in a few slides later. And the graphic was designed by designer, not by us. So <laughs> I believe you appreciate it. Um, another good thing is that the data lifetime, or I don't know how to call it, but basically now, if you provide a kickstart file to the Anaconda, it is read, then it is available for the UI elements as self.data, and at the end of the installation, the new kickstart is written from whatever was changed or configured in the UI. Uh, as I've mentioned, with the multi-thread feature, the customization screen, uh, now the customization screens can be placed on the UI which uh, shows the installation progress because the installation takes place in a separate thread and only there's some commu communication between the threads that, that makes the uh, UI updates possible. Also, the great thing is that finally, there is a lot of code that is shared with the new purely textual text mode and also with the initial setup, the new first boot we have. Altogether, it is more transactional. So you have a screen when you can modify your configuration and then hit one button, which is begin installation. And until you hit this button, no, no, nothing changes on your underlying system. So it's, it cannot be reverted as a transaction but it still is more transactional than, than the previous model. Also, the PyAnaconda storage uh, submodule was separated as Blivit, which is a library that will be used by the OpenLMI project also. And just to show you that it was not only a UI rewrite, these are the numbers of insertion and deletions in the Git repository uh, before we started the, uh, uh, from we started the rewrite until the blue was separated. If it, will, if it was to today's state of the repo, it will be like 80,000 deletions before, because the blue was separated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great job. <laughs> so here is a picture that is something like overall architecture of the Anaconda. Uh, we have four major uh, Python modules. One is YAM that is doing the package installation, Blivet that is doing the storage configuration, PyKickstart that is a parser and also some kind of val validator for the kickstart file. And then there is PyAnaconda that is gluing everything together and also providing things that are not in these modules or any other modules that can be used from Python. So the basic building block is the data structure. It is basically an in-memory representation of the kickstart file. And there is an overlay from the PyAnaconda module that adds execute and setup methods. Uh, the setup method of the data structure is used to modify the runtime environment if it's needed and the execute method is used to configure the target system, so after the package installation. Then in PyAnaconda module there are hubs, categories and spokes. All is controlled by the thread manager because we have so many threads now that we have something to control them. And there is a message queue 
that allows the communication between the threads and the UI. And there is this part of the picture. It's like the part that is up to you guys. And they are add-ons that can provide spokes and the code that drives the data. So as I have already mentioned, the life cycle of the data structure in the new UI is, was very str was streamlined and it's quite straightforward now that everything is stored in the data object which is basically an instance of PyKickstart Kickstart handler. It is loaded from the Kickstart file before the installation start. Of course, if any Kickstart file is provided. Then it's updated with the user choices made in the UI. Then it drives the installation. And at the end of the installation, the new Kickstart file that can be reused is written out. It has very simple tree structure. And the good thing is that it is now read, updated, and also written out by the initial setup, the new first. I have already mentioned the setup and execute methods that take care of the installation logic. Another big feature of the new UI Anaconda is that we have a, this nice GUI model, or it's the UI model. Actually, it is used in the text mode also. There are basically three types of elements. This one we call a standalone spoke. Then there is a hub. And this one we call them normal spokes. And just to briefly tell you why we chose this model. It is really, it provides easy and fast access to basically everything that can be set up in the installation or configured. Uh, there is no need to visit every spoke if user considers some part of the configuration uh, not important or user simply don't understand what the part is used for, he or she can just leave up to the installer to pick up defaults and don't care about it. Also, it provides a nice overview of all settings and this overview is updated by the background threads in our case. Another important thing for us, because we wanted to the new UI to be as extensible as possible, is that this, this UI model is really great for extensions. And as I've mentioned, it is used in the text mode also. So this is how, it looks, how our implementation looks like. This is the hub. Then there are three categories of spokes, and then there are these six spokes. So let's get to the hubs. Uh, nice thing is that hubs and also the standalone spokes are dynamically collected from the predefined spaces, which allows us to collect also the add-on hubs. And then the spokes and categories are collected for every hub. So far we have the summary hub, the one that you've seen in this picture, and also the progress hub that displays the installation progress, but also contains a spoke to configure root password, and what is almost finished is the user configuration, so that you can create users for your system during package installation. And you may continue from one hub to another when all mandatory spokes are completed. But in case of, or the same goes for the automated installations that show the summary and progress, but continue automatically if it's possible. So it's, if everything is provided in Kickstart, we just show you the summary and the progress, but you don't have to do anything. But if you do something, this, automated steps stop so that you are not confused that it automatically goes on once you, for, for example, fill in the missing piece. 
Then apart from hubs, we have spokes. We have two kinds of spokes, standalone spoke and normal spokes. These are the Python classes. And there's, there are also two important or three important GTK widgets that are the, win the, the base windows of these spokes. They can be ma marked for use in the initial setup or not, if you don't want to. And they are supposed to contain only the UI controlling logic. So everything that is an installation logic is left up to Blivet, PyAnaconda, or also the self data uh, execute and setup methods. <laughs> UI, should be, UI should be defined in a Glade file, everything that is possible, because there are things that are not possible to be configured in Glade, no matter how you try. And one important thing is that every spoke has a showable property that determines if the spoke should be shown or not. So if the hardware or if you have a spoke that is hardware specific or something like that, you can easily check and then return false from as the value of this property and the spoke will not be shown. The basic building block of the new UI is this no normal spoke. It looks uh, uh, the piece of the hub that represents the spoke information looks like that. I may go back to the, yeah. like this piece or, yeah. And as I've said, I want to encourage you to write Anaconda add-ons, so I will briefly introduce you to API that is defined for spokes, because that is the part of the UI that add-on should support. We really don't encourage you to provide hubs and standalone spokes because the things get really complicated. The, somehow the dependency solving between the standalone spokes and hubs gets complicated. And also it is a step back to the wizard model instead of hub and spoke model. So there are these API defined attributes. One is UI file, main widget name, category, the icon of the spoke, the picture shown on the hub, and also the title. The UI file is obvious, and main widget name is the name of the main window. Then there are API defined methods, initialize and refresh. Initialize is a method that is called when the UI is initialized, and the refresh is the method that is called every time the spoke gets displayed. So it should it should update the UI state according to the data set in the pike start or the self data structure. Then there are apply and execute. Apply is a method that is supposed to reflect the state of the UI to the self data, so basically to the kickstart. And execute is used to do all runtime changes that are needed. Then there are API defined properties. One is Reddit that tells if the spoke can be visited or not. Then there is status, which is this short message displayed on the hub. So it should somehow summarize the state of the spoke, if it's finished or not, and what data is missing, if any, and stuff like that. Then there are two important properties. One is mandatory which is obvious if the spoke is mandatory to be completed or no. So, and the graphical representation of the value of the completed property is this little triangle with a warning. And I'd like to mention that we are thinking about moving this triangle to the <coughs> icon as an emblem of the icon so that it's better visible. So what I've already mentioned, we have many threads that are running in the background and leaving the main loop responsive. But this 
brings many problems because you cannot run two GTK main loops from separate threads. It crashes the X server and or GTK. I, I didn't find the key that determines which one crashes first, but it happens all the time. On the other hand, the logs that allow you to control GTK from two separate threads are no longer supported, and actually they were never recommended for usage. And the only supported thing, uh, the only supported way how to handle multiple threads with GTK is to use idle add and the related functions to get everything to the main thread. So because of that, we have uh, two, G two decorator. One is GTK thread weight that enables a thread to run a dialogue or something like that in the main loop and then get the result back. It's a blocking call. And then there is GTK thread no weight that just puts the uh, function to be called to the main loop so that it doesn't crash the X server. Also there is GTK run once. There is only a helper function to ensure that the, th the function that is called with the, that is added with the idle add I is not called forever. We have threads for basically all long lasting actions to make the UI responsive for all the time. And this brings some problems because there are quite many of them. So we have a thread manager singleton and also our own Anaconda thread class, which is inherited from the Python threads. And these classes together facilitate logging and the threads usage and also exception handling because if a thread raises an exception in Python, it doesn't trigger the exception handler by itself. So we need to take care of this. Um, to make the communication between threads possible, we have two message queues. One is hub queue, that is for spoke to hub communication. The other one is progress queue that is used for reporting and updating installation progress. We have also experimental implementation for the text mode of reacting on async events and things like that, but text mode doesn't have a GTK or glib main loop, and it basically is almost always waiting for input. So it's not that straightforward to implement something like that that is possible for GUI easily. So everything I've mentioned till now allowed us to write a new first boot that is called initial setup. It is not called first boot because the first boot, the legacy first boot has to survive because there are some third party plugins that we have to support and we want to support and we actually don't have an idea who has the, the plugin for the old first boot. But the nice thing is that the new first boot, this initial setup, is basically only 40 lines of code. It is reusing Anaconda code and also the Anaconda screens. So it's only some wrapper, I would say. Another nice thing is that it reads ki the kickstart file produced by the Anaconda and writes a new one in the end so that changes that are made during first boot are reflected to the resulting kickstart file. Also, it coordinates screens with Anaconda. This is something that is already done, but the missing part for now is the, the coordination between <coughs> initial setup and GNOME initial experience. But these are only discussions ongoing on how to how the data should look like so that it can be used, it can be easily used by the GNOME initial experience. And, is, and the initial setup is targeting Fedora F18. It's almost ready. 
this is how it looks like. As I've mentioned, it shares the code with the Anaconda, and you can see the user creation code here. And probably the most important thing I want to get from you is that you get a notion on how to write an Anaconda add-on. Because the problem is that there are many teams that want something to be set in the installation process or during first boot process. But we cannot develop and maintain all that stuff. Sometimes we even don't understand what it, sh it, what it is supposed to do. So we really need to, you guys write add-ons that you understand what they are supposed to do and we can use them. Here I have some examples of the possible add-ons. One is for AD and Kerberos Realm join with Realm Beam. It is actually being partly written. The other thing is the open SCAP secu or the SCAP security profiles that were mentioned on the presentation about SCAP if we were attending it. There will likely be something for the subscription management. And the last thing I have there is Emacs. And let me tell you a little story about how this got to the list. Actually, originally there were things like web browser, Tetris, and some other game. And then, then I realized that if we write an Emacs add-on, we get all this stuff and also <laughs> a pure textual editor, so you know, it's all, all, almost everything that is needed to be done is write an Emacs add-on. Something about the add-on development, the kickstart part that handles the part of the kickstart file is the only thing that must be implemented. It's the golden rule for Anaconda altogether all is that, that everything has to be supported in kickstart and something from it has to be supported in the user interface installation or the manual installation. So, but the kickstart part is only a simple class parsing lines from the special add-on section and then storing data from them as its attribute. Or in, the mean, in the time of the installation, it lives under the self data add-ons subtree that is available to the GUI elements or the UI elements to be precise. Uh, it should provide methods to modify runtime environment and configure the install system. These are the setup and execute methods as I've mentioned many times before. The optional part is the UI part that could be a GUI and also TUI spoke, reading data from self data and modifying them in some way. And this part can be marked also for, marked for usage also for the initial setup. But don't worry, uh, a simple add-on I have written, I can show you the add-on. It is this, it is this hello world one with a cool icon. Uh, it is a very simple add-on that just takes things from the kickstart file. Actually, I can show you the kickstart file as well. So this is the add-on section for the org Fedora hello world add-on. And this is the text that should be squashed by the add-on to one line. You can see that it was squashed. If you get to the add-on, it has this simple screen with only the text entry and one button to show the dia dialogue. That is Lightbot. There is an API provided by Anaconda to Lightbot the dialogue. So it's only an example of the Hello World add-on code. Yeah, 
you cannot click somewhere else. And there is l this little button to delete the, and you can see that the status and the completed state was changed when I removed the text. From the packaging side of view, or yeah, like packaging, it's a uh, add-on is actually a directory under user share Anaconda add-on in the installation image. Uh, it has sub for, or the top level directory should be named with the name of the add-on. So the, the org Fedora Hello World you have seen in the kickstart section. It has sub for particular parts. So the kickstart part, the GUI part, and the TUI part. And actually what is still being decided is how to get these data to the installation image. The one option is to get them installed by Lorax as an RPM. This is one I like most, but it means that somebody will be able to decide what add-ons should be installed by default to the installation images. The other way that we may support the product image for this so that the add-ons can be added to the compose anytime. Uh, and as I've mentioned it with the uh, hubs and spokes, the classes from add-ons are automatically collected and they are used if they are subclasses of the classes defined by the API. As for the add-on development how-to, there is this uh, well-commended Hello World add-on you have seen. It has like, I don't know, 100 lines of code and more than 200 lines of documentation. Uh, hopefully there, there will soon be some sources of real working instances. And also there will be an Anaconda add-on development guide, which I will be working on, but for now it has only a title page and an abstract, so nothing useful. We, we encourage you to ask questions and we will answer them on the Anaconda devil list so that if you want to develop an add-on and you are not sure about something or you need some advice, feel free to ask and probably me or somebody else from the team will give you the answer. Of course, to develop an add-on, you need Anaconda, Anaconda widgets and Anaconda widgets develop packages installed. Or if you like a bit more hacking, you just need a Anaconda sources then run make, and then we have this make run spoke target in the make file that allows you to run your own spoke, but it is basically doing a change route with environment variables, so I'm not sure it's really great thing to use, but you can try it. Also, since there were some frequently asked questions about add-ons, I have put these two slides to show you the answers, but probably the better thing would be to make you thinking about the answers because there are, these are not great questions and it's up to discussion to come with some better. So why such a bad name? Because we simply don't have a better name. There were some suggestions, but nothing that really could be used and everybody will be happy with it. Other frequently, frequently asked question, what happens if the add-on for some add-on section in the kickstart is missing? Nothing, the add-on section is just ignored and pasted to the resulted kickstart <coughs> so that the kickstart can be used in case where the add-on is actually uh, present the only option for writing add-ons as far as the language goes, it's Python only because we dynamically search for it and load it and 
we are not probably going to deal with any other language support. And this is quite a tricky question, I would say. Uh, why this add-on section that is marking the functionality as being amended? Because if you write a kickstart file that has this section, you can see that it is something that is not actually the part of the installer itself. So it, it is a question if it is a problem or not, but some people think it is. <coughs> there is a possibility for an add-on to register the command, kickstart command, so that it looks like a line of the kickstart file almost indistinguishable from the rest of the kickstart. But the problem is with the tool that is called KS Validator. I'm not sure if anybody of you used it, but it needs to distinguish between the line that is malformed and no longer supported and the line that belongs to the add-on that, no, that is missing. So we were thinking about something like to, something like prepending these lines with the minus character, which will have the same semantics as the make file, so that the lines that are prepended with the minus character are ignored in case there is some error. So to summarize it, uh, the new UI rewrite, and I hope you already understand that it was not only a UI rewrite, is still work in progress. It, it is really multi-thread. It is GTK3 based. So something that is maintained and developed and hopefully improved. Uh, and it provides better user experience with a new clear UI model and also the possibility to take some actions during the package installation and <coughs> everything that lasts for a long time. The user is not blocked to sit in front of the computer and wait until something happens. Also, and this is due to add-on support, we need to have better documentation of the code. And because of that, the code is, has better maintainability, which is quite important for us because it is a lot of code and we are working on multiple branches in parallel. So the maintainability is really important for us. And this is also the main reason for the add-on support so that we have a code that works but is not maintained by us. Uh, Nice thing is definitely the modularity and it is something tightly connected with the fact that a lot, lot of code can be shared between the GUI, the text mode and the initial setup. This wouldn't be the, and it, it was actually the case of the old Anaconda that it wasn't possible to share the code because the, the actions were mixed with the UI logic. So you were, it was not possible to take something from the GUI code and place it to the text mode. You will get like something like X server not started. It's easy to write add-ons. As I've mentioned, the Hello World add-on you have seen, it has like 100 lines of code. So nothing really bad. You can do it in an hour. Actually, I was doing it yesterday in an hour, not with the Hello World add-on, but with the add-on for the SCAP presentation for the screenshots. So it is possible to do it in an hour. And altogether, I would say to summarize the movement of the Anaconda development is that it is really less scary for both users and developers. The code is much clearer now the UI is much clearer now, and it's, I believe it's more open than it used to be. So we are open sourcing. 
there are some useful links. Actually, I was, I was not, I was not able to make them more visible in the impress, the LibreOffice impress. There were no answers even on the Ubuntu forums. So <laughs> then I gave it up and you can click on them if you have the presentation. It will be available, I believe. So. Okay, are there any questions? And before you start asking, I would like to tell you that we have a public discussion in the Hack Lab number one. There are like 90 minutes, uh, so half and an hour reserved for us to discuss with you and hear your opinions and your suggestions. And I think, I believe, I will hear about some add-on you are going to write. <laughs> so if you want to contact us or me, this is my email address. This is the email address of the Anaconda Devil List where the discussion about the development goes on. Uh, there is actually also the Anaconda Patches List that is reserved for the patches, but we won't be mad at you if you submit your patches for your add-on or something like that to Anaconda Devil List for the first time. Next time you have to do it on Anaconda Patches. And there is also this IRC channel at Freenode. So I think we have two minutes or something like that. So one on one or two questions right now and the next for the public discussion. Nothing? Okay. Then thank you for your attention and I will be looking forward for your patches and add-ons. <laughs> <laughs>